This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 177 was recorded on July 25th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, the leading podcast when it comes to systematic trading and investing. Dr. Peter Warburton joins me as this week's feature interview guest, and we'll be discussing what I think is perhaps the most important issue on the long-term macro radar screen. When will secular inflation return? What will cause it? And what will its effects be? Be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview, when Patrick and I will address a listener question about the difference between bull and bear steepeners in the fixed income market, as well as more discussion on financial repression and inflation. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, let's jump to the S&P 500, because just earlier as the ECB was announcing, we had a, a break to a little bit of a higher high on an intraday basis. It looked like the S&P was ready to go and gave it all back. What's your thinking as we pivot here off 3,000? You know, I don't really have any any short-term view of significance here, Patrick. The fact that we were back at all-time highs this morning didn't surprise me that much. It's the same story in my book. Valuations are crazy too high. It doesn't make sense for me up here that markets are, are being driven higher. So the old paradigm is still in play, using Ray Dalio's uh, terminology, for now at least. I'm happily on the sidelines. We could go into a crazy melt-up. If so, I'll play that with 40 Delta calls and just roll them every month. I definitely don't want to be outright long because I think the market should either be entering a secular bear market or outright crashing. The thing is, you got to listen to what the market is, is telling you, not what you think it should be doing. What the market's telling me is it wants to go higher, as much as I don't think that makes any sense. When what's happening doesn't jibe with my fundamental view, I get on the sidelines and wait for things to start to make sense. That's where I'm waiting. All right, well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index because the euro continues to be incredibly weak. That dollar index is back toward 98 on the upper end. Is the dollar strength still going to prevail? Well, Patrick, the September dollar index futures contract touched almost contract highs. There was a very brief blip on May 23rd intraday, slightly higher. But uh, in terms of a closing print, unless there is a a sudden drop in the next few minutes here before the market closes, what we're going to see is a close above 97 spot 50. And I think that will be a contract high closing price if we get that closing print. So, you know, we're, we're definitely right on the edge of uh, annual R1 resistance. We're at the previous high on a contract basis. So I think we're maybe on the edge of a real breakout here. Now, the thing is, the most skillful of the bears are selling short in size here above 97 spot 50. They may push the market briefly back down. But if they're mistaken, and I'm right, and we do get a breakout, they're going to cover quickly above 98. So if we get that breakout, the smart ones will be covering or going outright long, and that's going to add fuel to the fire. Maybe the third time's the charm here. This will be the third major test of this level. As I've explained in previous episodes, we kind of have a a question about where the previous high was here. 97 spot 50 is what we call the contract high. In other words, if you look at where this September contract, the one that's trading now was at its prior high point, it's right where here where it was. But on the prior contract, the number was 98. So do you go by the number before? So that's sometimes called the continuation high, or do you use what's called the contract high? Some people use one, some people use the other. So you're going to find resistance at 97.50 and then again at 98. A clear breakout and a daily close above 98, I think, will unleash a whole bunch of buying. And I think it'll be a quick move from there much higher. But the breakout has not quite happened yet. We're right on the hairy edge of that resistance level. It's always possible that I'm wrong and that the people who are selling in size up here at the contract highs are going to be proven right. We'll see what happens.
Well, let's move on to crude oil because crude uh, has been incredibly weak for the last two weeks. I mean, we're trading near $56 a barrel on the WTI right here. And it, by all accounts, it looks like it wants to go lower. But what, what's your thinking here? What, what are going to be the drivers in oil? Well, let's start with the inventory numbers. Crude oil drawing down an utterly massive 10.8 million barrels this week. Now, we have to qualify that. This is the second week after the hurricane, and you, you tend to have anomalies in the data where in the wake of the hurricane and the cleaning up and the getting things back online, you, you see depressed production and import numbers due to weather. Ships that were on their way to Houston turned around and waited at sea for the storm to pass and so forth. But we still have a really massive drawdown. That, needless to say, spiked prices higher for all of about 10 seconds. And then they traded off for the rest of the day. Uh, Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 1.4 million barrels. Gasoline, drawing down 0.2 million barrels. Distillates, building 600,000 barrels. So the tape action was decidedly down on a day where normally you would expect that kind of drawdown to result in huge action to the upside. As I've said many times in the past on this program, one of my favorite personal rules is the market's reaction to the inventory number is far more important than the inventory number itself. To see the market sell off in reaction to what normally would be such a strongly bullish number if it wasn't a weather anomaly, I would say, holy cow, this market really, really, really wants to go down. It's fighting that really bullish signal. I think what's going on here, though, Patrick, is people are writing off the big drawdown as a weather anomaly. They're not taking it as if it was a real normal 10.8 million barrel drawdown. U.S. production, meanwhile, holy cow, down 700,000 barrels to 11.3 million barrels. We were holding above 12 million barrels. All of a sudden, we're way down to fully 1 million barrels below the 12.3 million barrels we were showing just a couple of weeks ago. The thing is, once again, 15 rigs were evacuated and shut in in the Gulf of Mexico during the hurricane. We're still feeling those effects. Now, if we see this trend continue and we're seeing less than 12 million barrels of production for the next several weeks to come, that's a really, really important signal that says, okay, maybe the, the shale production growth has really come to an end. We, we can't make that decision in a hurricane affected week. Imports back up to 7 million barrels this week, exports back up to 3.3 million barrels. So as I've been saying for weeks, Patrick, the economics, I believe, the recession signals that we're seeing, the IEA's revised forecast saying that there's going to be less demand in 2020, all of these things come together to point to much lower oil prices. But at the same time, I don't really read the same meaning that a lot of people are, are reading into this Iran situation. They think that President Trump's comments saying we're ready to negotiate with Iran means a de-escalation. I'm not persuaded of that. I think that President Trump may intentionally be jawboning the market lower in order to set the stage to get tough with Iran. So I, I would watch very carefully for geopolitical risks escalating in coming weeks. But in the absence of that, I think there's a lot of bearish downward pressure on prices. And uh, right now we're still in between, we're right in the middle of the short-term moving averages. So that means the market's trying to make up its mind on direction. If we get a daily close that's well below all three of the short-term moving averages, the 5, 8, and 13-day moving averages, that would really tell me this market wants to move lower. Again, my caveat is watch out if Trump actually changes his mind on what he meant with his comments that the market so far has taken as a de-escalation relative to Iran. All right, well, let's move on to gold because last week it looked like gold was toying with a breakout to uh, multi-year highs and was ready to go. And then the dollar index started to rally. And since then, gold's been backfilling some of the, the, that strength. What's your thinking about the next move here on gold? Well, I bought gold today at 1412, which will probably shock some of our listeners, but it's, it's really not the reasons that you might be thinking. 
There is a technical setup here, which is we saw a breakout from a short-term symmetrical triangle pattern. Sometimes you get that and you go down and retest that uh, upper trend line on the triangle as a support line before moving much higher. So there is a technical setup. But really, the reason that I bought gold today is I had wanted, I was hoping that the dollar was going to pull back to 96 even, and that I could buy more dollar index futures at 96. That limit order never got filled, obviously. I did end up adding to my dollar position today at uh, 97 spot 31. That really puts me in a precarious position. If I'm wrong about the dollar, this turns out to be a, a topping market. If I've top ticked the market and added to my long position, I'm kind of in trouble there. I needed to hedge that. So I did buy gold today primarily because if I'm wrong about the dollar, I know gold is going to go shooting hard to the upside as the dollar tumbles, and that gold position is going to very effectively hedge what would otherwise be a loss on my dollar long. I think the most likely scenario, frankly, is I'll be stopped out of my long on gold as the dollar moves higher. But needless to say, we'll see what happens. It's been three major tests of this exact level, and so far we haven't seen a breakout. We'll see what this one brings. All right, well, let's move on to the 10-year Treasury yield because we've been hovering more or less in this uh, 2% to 210 level for over a month, almost two months. We've been just toying back and forth, but it doesn't seem like uh, bonds nor the interest rates uh, are ready to make a big move. What's your thinking? Are, is, is this uh, 2% going to hold? You know, it's it's hard to say. I kind of feel like I, I was waiting for a backing up in rates as an opportunity to get into the long side of this trade, looking for lower yields. Uh, I still think the recession signals are telling us that that's coming. Uh, I don't consider 2 spot 08 or whatever it is this afternoon as an incredible buying opportunity. If it was 2 spot 18, I might feel differently. So uh, I'm waiting for a little bit more of a pullback before I would actually buy here. But but I do think that other factors being equal, probably we're headed lower in rates. As you say, though, we seem to have gone from a very aggressive move lower in yields to kind of a holding pattern. We're treading water for a while. Let's see which way it resolves. All right. Well, thanks for the update. Before we move on to this week's feature interview guest with Dr. Peter Warburton, we have a quick housekeeping announcement. What's going on, Eric? Well, our listeners are absolutely loving all of our new expanded content, but they're loving it so much that our server has crashed twice now with the extra workload that comes. We've had basically when we send two All-Stars episodes out in rapid succession, it results in so many download requests that it's crashed the server a couple times. So we're upgrading to a bigger server on Sunday afternoon and evening. That is going to require a scheduled outage for the entire MacroVoices.com website. So so we'll be offline from 5 p.m. to midnight this coming Sunday, July 28th. But we'll be back on Monday with a brand new server with enough capacity to keep bringing you even more download capacity. And we're going to test it and see if it works this time. We're trying to get the ability to send Macro Voices videos out so they show up as a video podcast in your iTunes feed. Uh, that's what broke the server last time. So hopefully the new server has the, the horsepower to handle it. I want to send my thanks out to the many listeners who have donated and or set up recurring monthly donations in the last couple of weeks. It was your donations that paid for the server upgrade. So thank you so much for helping us to continue to deliver even more fantastic content to all of our listeners. All right. Well, thanks for the update. Now, this week's featured interview guest is Dr. Peter Warburton. Now, I had the opportunity to meet Peter in Toronto, and he impressed me with his understanding of inflation. Now, what was your thinking as to why it was a good time to invite him uh, to the show this week? Well, what impresses me is he's not just talking a lot like a lot of economists are about, you know, whether or not what the Fed did this week or last week is going to affect inflation or be successful at their inflation goals or whatever. He's talking about the big picture of, hey, we've got major changes in society's attitude towards spending and MMT and, and uh, entitlement programs and so forth that could have profound changes in the backdrop that we're used to of disinflation or almost outright deflation. And Patrick, this dovetails perfectly into one of my strongest views that I've held for more than 10 years now. And what I've said is, look, I don't know. It's beyond my pay grade to tell you exactly when we're going to get a return to secular inflation. 
but nothing lasts forever. The deflationary backdrop, it's going to continue until everybody thinks it has to continue forever, which feels like is what a lot of people think. Eventually, inflation is going to take us by surprise. And when it does, that's where you get to what could be the beginning of the end game. Because frankly, no matter what goes wrong in the economy, central bankers, if there's a disinflationary backdrop, and there's therefore no risk of runaway inflation as a result of accommodative monetary policy, they can solve just about any problem by printing money to throw at the problem. You can solve most problems that way, or at least I should say you can mitigate the symptoms of problems in the short term by throwing printed money at them. When the keys to the printing press are taken away, and I contend that secular inflation is what takes away the keys to the printing press, because suddenly central bankers can't print money without running the risk of exacerbating that into a runaway inflation or even hyperinflation. At that point, that's when all of a sudden the game changes and the central banker's ability to paper over our problems with printed money goes away and we have to pay the piper and face reality. So I I don't know when that starts, but anybody who's got a qualified expert view on when we might expect a return, not just of a little bit of inflation, but secular inflation that we have to worry about, or worse yet, stagflation, where we get high inflation in the face of stagnant economic growth, that's where I think we get to risk of the monetary end game really kicking into gear. I don't know when it starts. I look to people like Dr. Warburton to help me understand when that could occur. And this episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. Although I'm a global macro investor myself, it's a fact that quant-based hedge fund strategies are dominating the rankings of top performing managers. These are rules-based strategies that remove human emotions and therefore can be well-researched and tested. And this year, they're off to a flying start. And there's one podcast that covers this area of finance better than any other, TopTradersUnplugged.com. And right now, Macro Voices listeners can even get a free book explaining how these systematic strategies can work for you. Just go to toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro to claim your free copy. Again, that's toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro. Check them out. You'll be glad you did. All right. Eric's interview with Dr. Peter Warburton is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Dr. Peter Warburton, Director and Chief Economist for Economic Perspectives Limited. Dr. Warburton, it is such a pleasure to get you on the program because something that I have been thinking about for years and frankly people ridicule me about is it seems to me like if you look at all of the policy decisions of the last several years and the people who have criticized them, myself included, it seems to me like what's going on is we can get away with these things until inflation gets in the way. And once we have an inflation problem, all of a sudden central bankers can't just paper over our problems by printing more money because it would exacerbate the inflation. But most people think inflation, hey, we haven't had it in recent history. We've had a deflationary backdrop. It's not a problem. You gave a presentation back at the end of June called Blowing Up the Box. And what I really like about this is your perspective resonates so well with mine that if you want to understand inflation, you can't just think about past history. You've got to think about not just the economics, but also the political environment. So please fill us in. What do you mean by blowing up the box? What's the backstory on how you got to this set of views? And before we get into your slide deck, and by the way, listeners, be sure to check your research roundup email. There's a link to download both the slide deck that we're going to be referring to throughout this interview. So you definitely want that download. There's also a detailed commentary on this subject in a separate download link. Both of those are in your research Roundup email. If you're not yet registered and don't have a research roundup email, just go to our homepage and you'll see a red button next to Dr. Warburton's picture, which says looking for the downloads. Dr. Warburton, give us the the backstory, the big picture. Why are you thinking about inflation now when so many other people are ignoring it? Well, the truth is I've been thinking about inflation a long time. My first sort of visceral reaction to the global credit crisis, uh, which is now more than a, a decade past, was that the only credible resolution 
of the global credit crisis was the resurgence of inflation. And of course, the first thing that happened in 2010-11 was uh, we got some inflation. We got some commodity and oil price inflation. And it looked as though um, we were kind of on, on the way to a more inflationary world. But of course, that was uh, a very temporary interlude, followed by five years plus of disinflation and uh, clearly um, a very dominant view that uh, inflation was irrelevant to the conduct of investment and asset management. But no, my, my gut reaction, which is also, I think, my considered reaction, is that there are many forces that bear down upon the longer term outlook for inflation. Clearly, central bank policy, uh, monetary policy is one. But the political economic environment is another. Socioeconomic tensions uh, is another. Demographics is another. You know, basically, the reason we end up in a significantly different place in terms of inflation is a kind of societal culmination. And that in the end, monetary policy just gives way to what needs to happen to resolve the issues that have arisen may be built up over many years. Dr. Warburton, as we look at your slide deck, the very first slide has this uh, TNT explosive picture, and the the heading is blowing up the box. What box are we talking about? I assume we're talking about a policy box of some kind. Tell us, what is this policy box? How did we get here? And uh, what can we expect next? Yes, the idea of blowing up the box is that over the last 20, 30 years, we've constructed a policy box, which essentially has been a protection, first of all, against inflation, secondly, against unruly and excessive government spending and borrowing, and thirdly, interference from politicians in the timing of monetary and fiscal policy decisions. So we've evolved over this long period of time. So if you like, we want to start with the chaos of the 1970s, post Bretton Woods. And we, we've sort of constructed this box. We, we decided in the 1980s that inflation was public enemy number one. We needed, we needed a policy framework that addressed high inflation, brought inflation down. We needed a policy framework that brought public sector borrowing under control. So we, we needed some kind of a balanced budget rule. We had still very restricted markets. We had a lot, a, lot of, a lot of protectionism, a lot of controls, a lot of leftover stuff, really, from the Second World War. So we needed liberalization. And so that, that's been another part of, of the framework of the box that we built. And interestingly, what we also did, we basically wanted to separate, this, this kind of came a bit later, but we wanted to separate the inflation control part of policy from the budgetary control. And to do that, Essentially, we we had to set up a funding rule whereby if the government did borrow it to excess, then it was to be funded by the primary issue of of government securities and not through inflation. So that's the policy box. And it served us pretty well through the 80s and, and 90s, leading into the crisis period in the end of 2007 and onwards. But essentially, the, the, it wasn't a perfect box. If it had been a perfect box, we wouldn't have had a financial crisis. The bit that was left out was there was no control of systemic leverage. And so if you like it, for me, it was systemic leverage that blew that original design. And so out of the the sort of the, the ashes of the financial crisis, we put the box together as best we could. We made some changes. We, we, we brought in QE. So we broke the funding rule. We suspended the balanced budget rule because uh, it was going to take a long time to repair public finances. And we ignored departures from inflation targets uh, rather more than we had before. So there were a number of things that we did. But essentially, that, that sort of botched, patched up on the run box has had some increasingly disturbing characteristics in terms of of the relative fortunes of people uh, across the income spectrum and across the wealth spectrum. And it is, I think, those design faults which have brought us to this juncture now and why we have the politics that we have now and why we have the threat of blowing up the box. Dr. Warburton, as I look ahead to some of these slides, uh, it seems like a really important theme here is that the reasons that you see this policy box 
potentially coming to an end or blowing up has to do with financial repression. So let's do a, a quick review of financial repression and how it relates to this story. I think it's possible quite reasonably to describe the objectives of central bank policies as having a desire to repress the nominal value of interest rates. And clearly that originally was merely to lower short-term interest rates to their um, practical minimum. And latterly has become a, a desire to suppress, repress interest rates across the whole yield curve using large-scale asset purchases, using forward guidance, and, and using other, other uh, technical techniques to manipulate the, the central bank balance sheet. So why would you want to repress interest rates? Well, clearly, the context here is that post-crisis, the public sector debt ratio has increased very significantly. So in European countries, where it was typically maybe around 50 or 60 percent of GDP, it's now pretty much 100 percent of GDP. Obviously, some countries started higher and have gone higher still. Uh, and the U.S. similarly was down in the 60, 70 percent range pre-crisis and is now up in the in the 90s. So the context here is wanting to minimize the burden of debt service for the government. I mean, that's, that's a, a fairly obvious objective to have. Otherwise, your debt service cost rises and it squeezes out all the other programs. So I understand the logic of financial repression. But what's happened here is that because financial repression has been successful in its initial stages, the assumption that many people are making is that this is the world in which we remain. Indeed, uh, some while ago, this was coined the new normal, you know, a world of very low interest rates, very low inflation, but very weak or uh, you know, stagnant growth. But what I'm arguing here is that financial repression, if it's to be successful, has to have a second phase. It has to have a second act, if, if you like, if it was a, a play. And the second act is unanticipated inflation. And so the whole context of the presentation is to say, what is it potentially that brings us into a new environment in terms of much higher inflation and indeed, of necessity, unanticipated inflation? And so that, that's the context of the presentation. So the successful second act, as it were, of a financial repression is the, the unanticipated inflation that depresses the capital value of fixed income assets. Dr. Warburton, I, I just think this is such a timely topic because every time I talk to anyone in professional finance about inflation, they laugh at me and they, they act like, dude, you don't get it. You know, haven't you been paying attention? We've got a really serious problem with disinflation. We, we need inflation. We can't get it. And, and the more I hear that, the contrarian in me says, boy, we must be getting close to the point where everybody is taken by surprise. And I'm not sure exactly what's going to trigger it. And I'm absolutely fascinated to find out. So I think we've, we've kind of covered the first few slides in the deck in the conversation we've had so far. But moving on to slide 12 or 13, tell us a little bit more about this policy box. What is causing it to be, as you put it on slide 13, be hastily and arbitrarily redesigned? Sure. So the box, as I've drawn it on, on slide 13, is so the, there are four vertical poles. So the first one is what used to be the fully funded budget deficit. It was the uh, budget deficit to be funded by additional issues of debt. But of course, that's been now been buffered by QE. So in other words, the central bank has taken huge responsibility effectively in the short term for the funding of government deficits. So that's point number one. The point number two is that the obviously the balance budget edict itself has been significantly bent by the huge impact of the financial crisis and, and, the, and the deep slump that followed. So we've relaxed the timescale over we expect the budget to be balanced. The third poll is um, about free movement of goods, capital and workers. So what we've seen really since 2009 is, is a kind of deglobalization. Um, we've seen some capital protectionism come back. We've seen at the fringes um, clearly the grounds of some trade protectionism coming back. And uh, generally issues about immigration have risen to the fore 
And then the fourth poll is really about the central bank inflation objective. And increasingly now central banks cast their objectives in terms of anchoring inflation expectations. So if inflation goes wandering off, either up or down relative to their objective, they tend not to take a great deal of notice, provided they can point to some kind of surveys that say, oh, the market is still confident that um, inflation will return to its objective. But over this long period of time, what's happened is this rather arbitrary redesign of the box has created some unusual effects. Obviously, this these have been well documented in that it's conferred an advantage to those that have had financial assets. So in a, a QE boosted and protected world, capital asset values have tended to, to rise. In fact, they've risen powerfully out of uh, the spring of 2009, which obviously has favored those who have more of those assets in the first place. Also, there's been a compression of real incomes. So when we look at the, the income spectrum, we find that a lot of people in the, uh, the, the lower in income groups have suffered relative income declines uh, in relation. So the economy has been growing, but it hasn't been boosting their after-tax incomes. And basically, year by year, the consequences uh, have got more and more extreme. And so it's no surprise to me that what we have in the political dimension is now a clamor for a redefining of policy priorities. And we can think about maybe some particular themes. So for some people, it might be about job guarantee. Other people, it might be about a Green New Deal. Other people, it might be about boosting the defense budget. Other people, it might be about infrastructure. But essentially, there, there are multiple narratives that say, look, we've got some really important spending priorities that are not being addressed. We need a policy framework that allows them to be addressed. And if that means higher deficits and more inflation, so be it. Now, the argument of the MMT constituency is essentially, look, the only downside to printing as much money as we need to fund whatever social programs might benefit society is inflation. That's, that's, the, that's the only adverse consequence. And we don't have inflation, so why not do it? Now, it seems to me like the answer is because inflation has a long lead time and you can do a whole lot of damage before the symptoms actually show up. Am I correct to think that? And if so, what evidence maybe supports that? The constraints of the box that I've described, they are they're self-imposed. So if you like, they are self-denying ordinances, uh, if you uh, want to make that allusion. In other words, it's not that we have lost the capacity to generate faster rates of inflation. It is that we have, if you like, tied our hands behind our back, or rather we've tied the politicians' hands behind their backs, and we've, we've put very strict limits around the mandates of our, our central banks in support of a stable inflation objective. But if there are more important things going on in politics and society, then those restrictions, which are man-made, they are artificial, they, they, they are, if you like, a response to the last inflationary cycle. They're a response to the high inflation of the 1970s. But if we want to loosen those constraints, then we can. And, you know, I think a lot of confusion has arisen because of the lack of inflation that has occurred in the context of large scale QE. Uh, and it would take a long time maybe to unpack in detail why massive additions to central bank balance sheets were not inflationary. But I, I think uh, that there's some good reasons why they weren't. And we can understand with hindsight much more clearly what they were. But it is a false assumption or a false progression of logic to say that we are now incapable of generating inflation. Essentially, we have the capacity either by requiring banks, commercial banks, to buy loads more government bonds than they currently do or making more loans than they currently do, which we obviously would re require that we relaxed their, uh, some of their capital adequacy constraints and so on. But these are all man-made things. We, we, we can make some different choices. And arguably, 
if we wanted to accommodate some other spending priorities, we would naturally undermine the framework that we have built. In other words, there would be there be other other priorities would have precedence, and we would subordinate inflation control and budgetary bounds. Dr. Warburton, let's go a little bit deeper on inflation targeting and the history of inflation targeting. What is the backstory here and what can we expect next? Yes, I'm looking now at slide 25 of of the pack and arguing that inflation targeting is now probably outgrowing its usefulness. So inflation targeting really only got going in the 1990s. Arguably, New Zealand was the first formal country to uh, the country to adopt formal inflation targeting. And it kind of spread across developed economies, such as Australia and UK and Sweden and so on. And in time, you know, dozens and dozens of countries have adopted inflation targets. But we have to remember that these are all 1990s uh, babies, and some of them are 2000 babies. They're, they're, this is not a long-standing institutional framework. It's something that we put together relatively recently. And so, as I said, it, the inflation targets were there for a purpose. They're, they're, they were there to reinforce a commitment to low and stable inflation. But we can ask now, what happens? We've got enough evidence of inflation target regimes operating in a wide variety of countries, including in Africa and Asia and Europe. What happens when the inflation target isn't allowing a necessary adjustment to take place? Well, we can see on slide 26, we've had some recent departures. So we have some big inflationary departures in, for example, Vietnam in 2008 and 2011. Since then, inflation's come back into range again. We've had big departures over the years in Russia. Yes, Russia, if you believe it, has an inflation target. And most recently, we've seen Turkey experience, obviously, uh, massively higher inflation than was consistent with their 5% inflation target. So to argue that somehow inflation targets are sufficient to establish permanent inflation control is nonsense. Basically, if the decisions that have been made around the conduct of monetary policy, in other words, decisions about public spending, decisions about the openness of markets, for example, inflation targets will, will just become a dead letter. They, you know, the, the inflation rate will just depart significantly and semi-permanently from the target. So my point really is, is that we might not think that we can be put in the same category in uh, countries like the the US and the UK as Turkey, Vietnam and Russia. But the principle still applies, is that if something more important needs to happen, inflation target is effectively disregarded, suspended and so on. And what's really interesting, if you look at slide 27, is we think, well, during the 1970s, that, that chaotic period, there were essentially no differences in the relative experience of those in the middle of the income distribution, the bottom of the income distribution, and the top of the income distribution. We have to go to the 1980s and 1990s and the adoption of inflation targeting to find increasing disparity. So the whole issue of income inequality has arisen in the context of the policy box that we put in place to put in inflation into a, a controlled policy framework and budget to be balanced and all of that. So if you like, we have created a fertile environment for dislocation of outcomes throughout society. And I'm arguing that, that if you like, it, it is this protracted period of dislocated outcomes. That's what brings us to the point now. And this is why the 2020 US president presidential election is so significant, is because it is now a battleground for extreme policy proposals and the voice of fiscal conservatism, the voice of the balanced budget, and spending within our means and all of that, that, that voice is, is barely heard. Essentially, the, the constraints that are in place at the moment and on which so much of asset allocation strategy is based, I think are looking increasingly fragile and the adoption of different policies potentially either by an ongoing Trump administration or by an incoming 
democratic administration, I think are incompatible with this policy framework staying in place. With regard to how quickly these things change, help us understand what the driving factors would be. Let's suppose, for example, if I look politically at what's going on, the voices are very, very loud, especially on the political left. The viewpoint is, look, We've bailed out Wall Street for way too long, way too many times. It's time to bail out Main Street. We need to institute universal basic income. We need to institute forgiveness of existing student loan debts. We need to institute new federal programs to provide free college tuition. We need to do a long list of other things. Nobody who's saying these things is offering the caveat, but I've also looked at Dr. Warburton's research, and I have some concerns about the potential inflationary impacts. No one's saying that. So it, is this a matter of when there is a, a change of uh, political control, when there's, let's say, a Democratic administration in the White House or a Democratic control of the Congress that might lead to a lot of spending programs that suddenly inflation expectations change overnight? Or is this something that always has a lag effect where it's going to take a while before the effects are felt? It's, it's difficult to know exactly over what time scale, even what looks like a, a very likely shift in policy behavior will occur. But the whole nature of financial markets to be, is to be forward looking. And um, it is the point at which investors begin to be unsettled on the horizon that they, they are used to investing and where they begin to see capital risks for which they require compensation. Now, as I say, that there is a battle going on between financial repression and the most recent, uh, I think, blatant example of that was the, um, the, the radical readjustment of the Federal Reserve's uh, balance sheet management announced in March, which effectively turned us around from a, a $360 billion injection of further uh, securities into the market to a $240 billion subtraction. So there was a $600 billion per annum turnaround in behavior. So if you like, um, you know, the Fed has doubled down on its repression and, and substantially changed the prospective balance in the Treasury market as a consequence. But, you know, clearly that's a trick that it can only pull occasionally. I'm not to say, obviously, uh, the Fed could revert to full-blown QE. And maybe this time it might buy a wider variety of assets. I think many people from different points of view view the return of large-scale asset purchase as a very likely scenario. And so you, you could say, well, I want to hold on to my financial assets because, you know, the central bank is going to be back backstopping capital values and, you know, therefore I'm, I feel secure um, in that assumption. But obviously countries are going to change their policies at different times and in, in different degrees. And I think there are going to be some very important judgments around about um, the extent to which you really want to leave significant portions of your portfolio in a fixed income market uh, where policy is likely to change radically and quickly. Something that's caught a lot of people's attention is the breakout through a very significant technical level in gold recently. And normally there's a very strong inverse correlation between the U.S. dollar index and gold. And it seems like gold is suddenly outperforming the expectations that the value of the dollar would imply. Is this potentially a sign of the market waking up to and recognizing that inflation is, is about to pick up? Not necessarily. I think, obviously, the ownership of gold is now quite diverse. And I, th I think it, it is no longer dominated by those who hold gold very specifically as an inflation hedge. So I think the better way to understand this is if you put, if you correlate the value of negatively yielding government bonds or total bonds in the system with the gold price recently, you, you find you get a pretty similar curve. So you, you could say that it is merely the subtraction of real yield, in other words, real yields uh, going back down again to zero and below zero, that if you like that, that is the, um, 
a propellant for the gold price in the most in the most recent period. In, in other words, it's the, the opportunity cost of holding gold has gone down. But the broader point I think that I would make here is that, and this goes back to blowing up the box, is to say if the whole idea of central banks being in some sense independent actors at the heart of the financial system aiming to control inflation, if that whole idea is is obsolete, then clearly we might look to things like gold to be telling us that there's a general loss of confidence in central banking. And, um, you know, one picture that I have is uh, it's a bit like um, Superman and, and kryptonite, that basically um, the gold price is, is a bit like kryptonite to central bankers, that they uh, they like to feel that they have provided a, a, a stable financial system and that uh, the yield that you get on um, an inflation-protected government bond is better in, in every respect to gold bullion that you have to pay to be stored and, and looked after. But the reality is that recently gold has been outperforming uh, inflation-protected bonds, which suggested that there's, there's something more serious going on. The last time that we went through quantitative easing and the market's reaction to it, there were widespread predictions that QE was going to unleash high inflation. Some people even went so far as to say hyperinflation. And of course, uh, many people would argue that that didn't happen as uh, as predicted. I, I would say that the inflation occurred. It just happened in asset markets rather than in the broader economy. What are the things that we need to watch for? Obviously, you know, if we're looking at forgiveness of student loans and free college tuition, uh, that's a completely different equation than buying bonds to suppress interest rates. What are the things that are most likely to unleash consumer price inflation in the broader economy? And, and how might the next experience with QE differ from previous ones? The way in which we might expect to see inflation return in the first instance might very well be through food and commodity prices. A lot of the work that we do on inflation is to try and integrate what's happening on, on the supply side, on the producer side of the, the goods and services market. And I think the environment that we're heading into is a tough one for producers. I think that, that there are going to be all kinds of challenges to the continuity of supply. I think that uh, diminished competition obviously uh, is putting us more at risk of uh, deliberate constriction of supply of food and commodities and natural resources. So I, I think one avenue that we could expect to see inflation surprise might again very well be food price inflation, potentially perhaps another spike in crude oil prices, but also, you know, Copper, iron ore, again, you know, some, some of these key industrial metals could also surprise to the upside. Dr. Warburton, as we discuss the potential of coming inflation, one of the prognostications that I've seen from some very smart people is just saying, hey, what's coming is 1970s or worse, stagflation, not uh, you know, stagnant economic conditions where we don't really see growth in the economy, but we still have price inflation anyway. Is the recipe set to deliver that kind of outcome? I think that's a, a risk that we should take much more seriously. I'd be ready to agree that we are probably late cycle in terms of global activity indicators. But I, I think what's fascinating about the latest batch of data, which we, we analyzed in some, in some detail, is that the by numbers of countries that have a, a higher inflation rate that is measured in terms of their, their GDP, their national accounts, higher inflation rate than a year ago significantly outnumbers those with a lower inflation rate. And at the same time, the number of those with a lower growth rate, a lower GDP, real GDP growth rate, significantly outnumbers those with a higher GDP growth rate of a year ago. So if you like, the, the twist in terms of numbers of countries is very clearly towards a more stagflationary outcome. And um, we've always sought to keep the, the activity and the inflation narrative separate. Uh, 
and I think for good reason, because all four combinations are regularly recorded in, in economic history. So what, what it means, I think, in, in the broad analysis is that whereas at the moment you might say that the you know, sort of computer services and uh, electronics and aerospace and defense might be, be quite sort of uh, favored sectors for, for the environment as it is today, but we're moving into an environment where we should expect to see food producers, maybe pharmaceuticals, healthcare, beverages, those kind of sectors uh, to gain more pricing power and to obviously to be able to increase their margins and uh, presumably record higher investor returns. So, I, you know, it, it's, uh, it's still early days, but I, I think there's indications of uh, the next twist will be in a stagflationary direction. Well, Dr. Warburton, this has been a fascinating interview for me. Something I've said for 10 years now is I'm not smart enough to know when inflation is coming, but I predict it's going to be the return of inflation that really is going to bring about some difficult times for the economy. In any event, you are the chief economist for Economic Perspectives Limited. For our institutional audience who may be interested in following your work or learning more about economic perspectives, how can people contact you and follow your work? Sure. You can find us at our website, economicperspectives.co.uk. And uh, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn or indeed uh, Economic Perspectives on, on LinkedIn. And just uh, or shoot us an email at info at economicperspectives.co.uk. Uh, we'll be delighted to engage with you and uh, share some sample research. Fantastic. Well, I can't thank you enough for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Dr. Warburton on the show to talk about inflation. But what, what I took away from it was when he started talking about financial repression, and I thought it was really worth us kind of taking a, a deeper, expanded dive into understanding repression. Because a lot of people, when they hear, you know, Juliet or any of our other guests talk about financial repression, a lot of people automatically just assume it's just keeping nominal interest rates lower than they would otherwise prevail to reduce government's interest expense and contribute to deficit reduction that a country is experiencing. But what I find fascinating about it is that their financial repression has a, a second element that is not always talked about. And it's this idea of how it is used to actually liquidate or reduce government debt. And so, you know, governments have different ways they can get rid of debt. Obviously, Trump tried to economically grow out of the debt. And uh, in, we saw in Italy and Greece where they uh, tried austerity as a way to manage the debt. And then, of course, there's all the, the boogeyman guests that come out and talk about, like, the explicit default of government debt. But through history, most governments deal with debt in two ways, which is they inflate it away or they engage in some form of financial repression to deal with that debt. And so, you know, to me, when, he, when we're talking about this inflation and this idea inflation is coming, to me, it's an actual complement to financial repression. Because if you're trying to suppress interest rates lower than they would naturally prevail, you're actually, the goal is to produce a negative real interest rate, which is uh, that you create like uh, what they reference to a, a financial repression tax or liquidation tax, which is if you create a negative real interest rate with the difference between inflation and uh, nominal interest rates, it's a transfer from creditors to borrowers. And uh, you can reset your debt that way. And that's why a lot of people, smart people reference to, you know, during the Bretton Woods era as a period of financial repression in dealing with all the post-World War II debts where this type of exercise happened. But one of the things I just want to uh, kind of pick your brain on and really discuss it this way is like, in the end, financial repression needs inflation. 
not runaway inflation, but you have to create negative real yields. Like in the end, we've seen financial repression in Japan for how long, but because they're having problems creating the inflation, they're not able to actually create debt reduction and that's actually hurting their repression. So the question is, should we have inflation? We, definitely, that's the goal to have inflation. Uh, the question is, can they create it to the right amount to allow this to actually be able to reduce some of that debt? Well, you know, inflation has a huge lag time. And I think what people have to remember, why is it that the Fed has been trying so hard to create inflation for so long and failing for so long? Is it really that they're stupid and inept? No, it's because there's a lag factor. And what I fear, Patrick, is... We have this situation where we haven't had the amount of inflation that the Fed thinks is necessary. And, and people are thinking, oh, it's impossible. We'll never get it back. Look, I have confidence in AOC and her squad to create lots of inflation if they're given the opportunity to implement their policies. So we can get inflation back. But the thing is, what we have now is this attitude that it seems like nothing that you do creates inflation. So therefore, we don't have to worry about the risk of runaway inflation. And I think what happens is you have the risk of policy, which at first, it seems like the people who are proponents of heavy government spending, MMT and so forth, it looks like they're being proven right because they pump lots and lots of money. It puts it in people's hands. Lots of people are happy. I've got money. There doesn't create problematic inflation at first. But when that inflation starts to get out of hand, it's already got momentum. And at that point, they can't stop it. And before you know it, we're into a stagflationary situation where the inflation, because of the lag time, it really takes off. And even after you slow down that government spending and entitlement programs and, and so on and so forth, the inflation is still crippling the economy. And I'm afraid that that's what we're headed to. And I think as far as understanding all of this, Ray Dalio's article, which we had linked in last week's research roundup, I think gives an excellent explanation of what financial repression is all about, what, what the Fed is really in the business of doing, what governments in general are in the business of doing, is playing God and deciding, should we punish savers in order to make life easier for borrowers, or should we punish borrowers in order to make life better for savers? And it's so easy to say, oh, well, all the people of the world, you know, we need to take care of the borrowers because people are hurting and so forth. Well, what about all of the pensioners? What about the pension crisis we're creating along the way? It's, it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be. Well, you know, Eric, the one thing, though, I think it's pretty consensus that, that there's about to be a fiscal spend in our future. At some point, these governments are going to start even potentially printing some of this money or monetizing some of the, that, that debt in order to drive that fiscal spending. But if, um, you know, like we share a story with, uh, in this roundup about Jeffrey Gunlack saying that, you know, a recession is imminent. What if during the next slowdown is when this big spend occurs? Because w during a recession, you have asset deflation, so all stocks and real estate and things like this come under pressure, and uh, unemployment rises, and most uh, consumer confidence drops, which usually can be incredibly deflationary just from a, that entire cycle playing out. What if the fiscal spending is just actually keeping everything above water rather than creating inflation? I mean, do you see any merit in that kind of an argument? Well, I think that that is a perfect setup. If that happens, and that's exactly the way it will start, so I think everything you described is, is very likely in our future in the next year or two. But what it does, Patrick, is it validates the proponents of MMT and, and heavy government spending. And they say, look, we're providing all of these benefits to society. We're taking this printed money and we're providing universal basic income and we're, we're you know, whatever they're going to do, they're going to forgive student loans and they're going to provide free tuition and, and whatever other entitlement programs they want to add to an already overburdened system. They're going to be validated. It's going to appear to be working and working well because all this money is going to be handed out and we'll have a deflationary or disinflationary economic backdrop thanks to the recession. So as you say, it all equals out and it's fine. But that just allows them to build more political capital to spend and print 
even more. And my prediction is that it, it looks at first like the MMT crowd or the geniuses because they've delivered all kinds of benefit to society. It didn't cause runaway inflation in the first six months, and that means it's a success. And they do more of it and more of it and more of it. And it might take several years before the effects of that are felt. But when they are felt, it's going to take several years for that momentum of inflation to come back out of the system. And I predict that that will create stagflation at some point in our future. Probably not in the next couple of years, but in the next 10 years, I think we've got a really heavy bout of stagflation, and that's where gold is going to be the asset to own. All right. Well, let's move on, Eric, because uh, I put together a chart because one of our guests emailed us asking for an explanation of the different types of steepeners and flatteners because they heard Julian Brigden talking about these and really wanted us to explain. And so I thought it was a great opportunity to put together a few charts to speak to it. So if you're looking for the downloads for this week's uh, presentation, you'll find it in your research roundup email or look for the red button for downloads right beside Dr. Peter Warburton's picture on the homepage. So uh, going into the chart book, I actually want to jump to page three first here, Eric, where I show the twos, tens spread, which is the the way that we often show where we are in terms of whether there's an inversion or where we are in the curve. And what I wanted to do on slide two is really kind of see where those numbers are derived from. So here, what I'm showing on chart two is today's yield curve. And that is just showing where at the different durations of government bonds, what is the interest rate at that? So there's the one month, the three month, one year, two year, five year, 10 year, and 30 year yields here. And of course, the, where the inversion is, which is where the lowest part of the interest rates are, all lie in the kind of two to five year window, which is caused on the short end of the curve, those inversions that we're hearing about. But we, have, we haven't seen inversion at the twos, tens. So how does this work? What, what is this idea of a, a bull steepener versus a bear steepener? And uh, so moving on to uh, chart four, we have uh, the example of a bull steepener, which is the idea that short-term interest rates are falling faster than long-term interest rates. Uh, So what's going on here with a bull steepener? Well, the reason that this is called a bull steepener is a, a little bit confusing and counterintuitive. What is a steepener to start with? A steepener means you're making a bet that the curve is going to get steeper. In other words, the right-hand side of the chart is going to be higher relative to where it is now, and the left side of the chart is going to be lower. What that bet really is, the way you put a steepener trade on, is actually with two positions. One of them is a bullish trade on short-term treasury paper. The other one is a bearish trade on long-term treasury paper. Now, if either one of those bets pays off, the curve gets steeper. But the question is, wait a minute, when we said the, the curve is steepening, it's steepening for which reason? It's steepening because the front end of the curve is going down in yield, or it's steepening because the back end of the curve is going up in yield? Well, the way that we answer that question is by which trade is being successful. If the bullish bet, and the part about this is is that seems to be very counterintuitive, is wait a minute, the front of the curve, the yield's going down. How is that bullish? Well, remember that yields are inverse or reciprocal of the actual price of the bonds. So if you're making a bet which is bullish on the price of bonds, you're going to make money when the yield goes down. So the bullish bet on bond prices is the one that profits when short-term bonds go down in yield. The bearish bet is the one that profits when longer dated bonds go up in yields. So the steepening that occurs when the bullish bet is the one that's responsible for making your profit, that's a bull steepener. The bull bet paid off. A bear steepener is when the bearish bet pays off. And the thing that's counterintuitive is the bearish one is the one where the the number on yield goes up and the bullish one is the one where the number on yield goes down. Right. So you can see that on page five, where we're showing that the yields on the long end of the curve at the tens and thirties are where they're the ones that are going up at a much faster pace. And that's where the long-term rates are rising faster 
than the short term, like you're saying there. And so when we go to pages uh, six and seven, now we're talking about the flatteners, which is uh, something we've seen a lot of. And uh, a bull flattener, uh, at the same way, Eric, is, is that the long term rates in this situation are actually falling faster than short term rates. And often, this is when inflation expectations are curtailing, right? Right. And again, the reason for that is if you're talking about a flattener, which is the opposite of a steepener, the flattener has a bullish bet at the long end of the curve, betting that the long end of the curve is going to go down in yield, which is a bullish bet on bond prices. And when that one is paying off, that is a bull flattener. Right. And so obviously, and then to the other side of it is, is a bear flattener, which is that short-term rates are rising faster than those long-term rates, right? And so often that is occurring, contributed by Fed raising interest rates. And if all of that is a little bit too confusing to follow, one very simple financial equation that you can easily understand is a price of zero for a 14-day complimentary access pass to Patrick's big picture trading service, where he gives daily webinars where you can learn a whole lot more about this stuff. But Patrick, we're going to have to leave it there in the interest of time for this episode. Today's episode was made possible by Top Traders Unplugged. Don't forget to go to toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro to claim your free book and subscribe to their podcast as well. For information on sponsoring Macro Voices, please visit macrovoices.com slash sponsor info. And don't forget to register your free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our free research roundup email which provides a compendium of links to all of the best content we could find on the internet each week, including downloads to support our own presentations, as well as all the best research that we could find. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book for Dr. Peter Warburton's presentation and the steepener charts that we discussed in the postgame. There's an article discussing Jeffrey Gunlack's view that the Fed will be in panic mode when the next recession hits, and a Jesse Felder article that leveraged investors could be signaling a bear market is underway. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at macrovoices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. 
Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.